This, the, the left hand side I think is uh, par for the course. Uh, everybody, those who know us, uh, know the range of areas. But what, I am, what we're trying to do is to re-emphasize the fact that Transnet actually is uh, six operating divisions. Um, and you are going to see us uh, speaking more and more about these uh, uh, divisions. When we were announcing our results recently, uh, Transnet properties, uh, as we indicated, really came to the fore. And you would see, actually, we have advertised the RFIs for uh, Carlton Centre, uh, where we are looking for a partner uh, who would come in with some interesting <coughs> ideas on what we can do for uh, with the Carlton Centre. And I think those of us, both South African and those of us who live in Joburg, and I have had so many people who grew up, I don't, um, not native to Joburg, who grew up in Joburg, who have been calling me and telling me how precious the Carlton Centre is. So we must make sure that we, we honour its preciousness. So we will be making sure, because we think it's iconic uh, as well uh, for South Africa. Um, so in, if you look at, and I know Andrew's, uh, Andrew should be also making a presentation either today or over the next days, um, our core strategy, when I am fundamentally am going to be focusing uh, over the next, in fact, um, this is the, probably the last time I talk about the segments, uh, Andrew will talk a lot more about the segments because I want to talk a lot more about funding of infrastructure. Um, the target is to get our iron ore numbers beyond uh, the 60 million tons to 70, 67 million tons. However, uh, one of the studies that we are completing, in fact, we asked UCT to help us uh, with that work, is to look at what is the um, uh, what is the health impact on humans of both manganese and iron ore in the air. Uh, as you'd know, Saldana at um, 60 million tons and uh, uh, manganese is around roughly 8 million tons at present. We really have to worry ourselves about the health impacts. And so that for us is going to be the, bounding, um, uh, the boundary for how far we can go with manganese and iron ore in, in, in Saldana. Uh, that study, when it comes out, we will discuss quite extensively because it's not about us only. Manganese, you know, our target number is 22.7 uh, million tons for exports. Uh, we're quite far down the line with the um, RFP for a partner to help us build the manganese terminal in Moha. Now, as South Africans, we need to make sure that we don't export manganese as dirt. It's the new minerals that we require for renewables, for the green industry. If we're going to be able to have a second chance at reindustrializing, these are the resources we have to watch like hawks as South Africans to make sure value addition happens here. Because I will keep reminding all of us is that we mustn't forget the fact that we've got 70% youth unemployment and 9% absorption of young people. And if you're not paying attention, you would have missed the news yesterday about what's happening in Tembisa. I really think it is about time that we acted in the interest of our country and not in the interest of our individual pockets. On coal, we've been quite upfront. We're not going to go beyond the 81 million tons uh, per annum. We are not hitting it very far from it. The force measure that we indicated last year, we were going to arrive at 60 million tons. As you read in the press, the mining industry and their journalists uh, go on an active attack as many times as they can. We'll deal uh, with that. Towards the end, we'll indicate to you uh, where we're at and where we're going. Coal, we've decided we're capping ourselves. We have a responsibility to deal um, with um, the greening, uh, with, uh, with the decarbonisation. And we have indicated that our intention is that by 2035, we should be neutral. Um, I don't know, it's not 2035, 2035. I think we said something like 10 years, so you forgive me because the years keep moving on and, and I've not marked a year in the calendar. But we're clear that we have to make a contribution as uh, Transnet. And frankly, as a company which borrows a lot of the money that we have, both in South Africa and globally. The big problem that we have when we go for fundraising is all of the funders say, ring fence, anything that has to do with coal or carbon, we're not going to fund that, you deal with that yourself. So it's a real issue globally. 
Chrome magnetite, really important. Um, the target is to get to 37 million tons uh, per annum, and we are maximizing um, on the flow towards Maputo. Now, the Maputo flow is really important for us because it enables us to have a short route and so ensures that our rolling st stock is kept uh, to uh, um, a manageable amount. The new relationship that we struck up with CFM will come up and uh, we decided, we agreed that we would pilot and see how we operate and how we, we um, the ben if the benefits are absolutely clear for both sides. And so far, uh, we always thought that they would be obvious because we basically, the end game is to create a single pool of rolling stock and to have put to port operations. We are starting to see some benefits in as far as that's concerned and we will be starting to run much longer trains on that one. And then obviously Richards Bay is the other port that we've targeted for that. Autos and containers and uh, agriculture are three commodities which would use the uh, fundamentally the container uh, corridor. Uh, there's a lot of work that we need to do on these and we are talking quite actively with government uh, to ensure that it is funded uh, appropriately so that we can be able to continue to drive uh, exports. I mean, an important thing that we all should not forget, uh, and we must always go back to that, I actually appreciated seeing your map, uh, uh, John, and the lines that you operate. For us, the Sishan Saldana line is 864 kilometers. Um, well, I'll talk when we, uh, I'll show you the I'll, I'll raise it, well maybe let me just say it now because I will forget. Um, the Bokhubai, on Bokhubai, one of the things that we're trying to do is to figure out if we can have a railway line which is around the 500 kilometer mark, uh, which would even be much more efficient um, through to the port. And as you know, Durban uh, Gauteng is uh, about 730 kilometers when you're coming into the manufacturing hub, right? So those uh, distances are real issues that we always have to deal with in South Africa. Uh, we spent some time um, recently in, at the beginning of the year in Thailand. Um, virtually every single vehicle that arrives at the port is on road because the furthest um, plant is about 167 uh, kilometers from the port relative to our 730. So those differences are quite real and it's quite unfortunate that whenever we report, we never go contextual. It's just an attack uh, with, that, with ignoring uh, that issue. But we've got to do a lot more work around finding ways and means of ensuring efficient transportation of agricultural uh, commodities um, to the port. Also, manufacturing is, a, is the issue of uh, size. It's not a train. It's not 400 wagons or 200 wagons. There you have to be running trains which are 50 wagons and it's uh, lots of shunting, a lot of consolidation, and that's why it's important for us that we partner with the private sector in that area. And then the last segment would be fuel and gas, and we are moving TPL a lot more strongly into uh, the, the, gas, uh, the gas space. So what I wanted to focus on, because I think that it's about time that we had a real conversation, and Jan, really, um, the, the, the move, so we are absolutely supportive of the uh, rail white paper uh, as, as Transnet, because when you compare yourself as I'll, you'll see the next line, little old South Africa to, to Germany and their GDP. And you look at the amount of support that the government puts in um, into rail, um, both uh, passenger as well as uh, freight, you are in a hiding to nowhere. Their reform started in 1994, and to be honest, I suppose as Transnet, if we had been a lot more open uh, to engagement, we might have actually moved a lot faster than what, uh, than what we are trying to do at this particular juncture. Unlike the British system, which is fundamentally passenger, the German system is majority just 57% uh, freight and 43% uh, passenger. This slide just is a brief comparison just of uh, uh, Transnet as well as Deutsche Bahn. It must show some ambition. I mean, whenever I look at the employees in, in Deutsche Bahn and the number that we have uh, in TFR and in the whole of Transnet, um, there's much to be done because actually, um, and it's not, it's about the jobs that you create on a sustainable basis throughout the value chain. In the case of uh, Germany, the federal government uh, supports directly 
the funding of construction and the replacement of railway infrastructure. Um, from 2020 to 2029, about 63 billion euros was put in by the federal government into Dejaban. Dejaban is a company just exactly like us. There is some, uh, uh, some of the shares are listed, uh, but so it's not entirely 100%, but if it's not 100%, it's 100% state owned, but it may not all of it be uh, federal government. I just can't remember the proportions at present. But it is an important uh, point, this, about how infrastructure is funded. If you look at uh, the uh, Venn diagram on the right-hand side, that indicates total financial support from the EU for infrastructure in Europe. Um, rail, the 308, translates to about 5.2 billion rand over the period. This is Zippo uh, that comes into South Africa. In our case, um, I, what I wanted uh, to show on that one, sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention them, is to show the ones which are funded from the fiscus. So Austria is funded in part from the fiscus. France, um, <coughs> I know in France I need to understand what the green bonds are, but from what we've been understanding in the US, it's also a way of supporting because it gives you very low interest costs, which is one of the things that we would appreciate paying at 11%, uh, at nearly 12% uh, for our work. Trust me, we could do any discount below that number is helpful. Uh, Norway, state funded. Um, Spain, yes, uh, yes, Spain, state funded. Uh, Switzerland, state funded. And Germany, obviously, as I've indicated, state funded. And South Africa, completely capital markets. Now that has created some of the challenges that we face. We are constantly attacked um, by uh, emerging miners, frankly, Rightfully so, uh, because more often than not, we're not able to give them access to the heavy ore system. In the case of uh, the iron ore line, um, in 2005, we, ended into, we entered into a 25-year contract um, with um, Kumba because we didn't have the cash to fund the upgrade, and so they came to the table and they were willing to fund. What that is teaching us and this is why we've started engaging, is that if we continue in this direction, we will create exclusion. We will create, we will fight, we will militate against the very thing we are trying to uh, create, which is an inclusive economy. So we're talking to government and we're saying, you have to fund us. Because if you don't fund track expansion, you put us in this difficult position where you've got to go to the private sector, and then when, and frankly, you know, sometimes, and I'm pretty certain that at the time, it was a pretty open invitation. And those who had money were able to come to the table, and those who didn't have money didn't come to the table. So it creates an exclusive club if you do that. We need to get government support so that whenever expansion is required, we can expand without being dependent on some other private partner helping us to fund us and then create exclusion. So it's for this reason that one of the things we're starting to review is the length of the contracts. Now, you either go for a five-year contract, and to be frank, five-year contract would be ideal in an environment where you don't have certainty of who's going to come in and fund you if you're going to be constantly uh, uh, rolling forward with your infrastructure and going into the capital markets and still staying true to inclusion. You have to go for short contracts. But we understand that the minute we go for short contracts on the rail side, we create a problem for the miners because your funders want to know a little bit longer certainty. So ideally, you would like to get 10-year contracts. So what we're trying to get to is that could we do 10-year contracts? But the only way we do 10-year contracts, if we are sure that when there's demand available and we can verify it and people are, all, are willing to sign for it, we can then enter, uh, get either funding directly from government or uh, be able to immediately expand capacity without being dependent on this instrument that we've used previously. So quite critical that we sort of like deal with this problem frontally. And it's not about whether you concession or not concession the system. Because the minute you concession, you concession the system, yeah, you're going to have a huge job trying to prove that there's excess capacity for a third party to operate. So we are firm fans, uh, big fans, of the eminent uh, economic regulator and even the competition going forward because you are now going to be able to be held accountable to why did you or didn't you uh, give access to X, Y, and Z. And as John tells you, it's a bit more complicated than, than we'd like to think in South Africa. I put the slide up as a reflection. Germany remains the third largest exporter globally. 
Um, come back, remember the amount of money that uh, the government puts in. Look at our contribution uh, to GDP, logistics cost to GDP. Now, at 11.8, maybe it doesn't look too bad. The Americans are 8%. Americans got a huge economy, a huge uh, geography that has to be covered, 8%. We're still uh, looking for uh, the exact data for, for Germany. I'm sorry I've got a raise. Uh, we're, we're in the process of finding it so that we get a little bit more accurate. But I would hazard that it's much lower than our 11.8%. Uh, it's material because logistics adds no value. The thing is just on a truck or it's on a train moving from one point to the other. Ideally, you want to squeeze that number as low as you possibly can um, so that you can ensure that there's greater efficiency in the system. So just, I'm not going to repeat this, we've already heard um, the, the presentation on the real white uh, paper, but really the point is, in terms of allowing third party access, absolutely back it. But you evolve um, a deregulated system. You don't just wake up one day and you suddenly have a system which is su suddenly completely open because you've got learnings to make. When we spoke to the Germans, they said to us they took 10 years before they would reach stability. I keep on reminding everybody, Germany is a very homogenous society to what we are. We're not that. And actually, they don't have the challenges that we have to be balancing all at the same time. But are we moving actively in that direction? Absolutely. Are we embracing it? Absolutely. But it requires a conversation. Remember, this is the country which is still trying to deal with just, in just transition. Whenever you read anything written about just transition in South Africa, nobody references the miners who live in Pumalanga or the coal or the people who work in the power state, coal-fired power station. Nobody. That is a sidebar in some statement elsewhere. Well, until we get to deal with the frontal issue of just transition is that we deal and we make sure that we deal appropriately with those individuals, um, we, we would not be able to have a, a solution going forward. Same here. In the rail system, there are people who have worked in this space for years. So if you are going to have sustainable change, you need to make sure that every single person who works in the rail system participates and move forward. DOT can tell you how it's going at NEDLAC right now. We have to have the same conversations internally. So really, the issue of moving as much rail-friendly cargo as possible off-road onto rail, back at 100% uh, that it must happen. But the other thing which we all need to start talking to is moving as much of our manufacturing coastally because we've got to start squeezing that distance. Because it, no magic can happen to reduce the cost. It, it's expensive. If, and also our escarpment is our escarpment. Is that not the case? I mean, you, to move from Durban, which is going to be, and our investment profile for Durban is definitely to get it back to be a hub port uh, for Southern Africa. You, moving from there up to Gauteng is a seriously steep climb, so it's really very expensive to come up. It's also very expensive to go back because you've got to be very careful about the speeds that you um, have to go back uh, towards uh, Durban. So that for me, I think we've got to start seeing a lot more in our economic policies around how we shift the manufacturing uh, in the economy back uh, towards the coast. It would be remiss not to talk about the slot sales. I know the slot sales are the most controversial thing in South Africa, and I don't quite understand why. Other than the fact that they are new, we are all going to learn. So South Africans, we should all just breathe in. We're not going to pull back on this. It's not us playing games. I said uh, in TFR when we, w the first word we used was pilot. I said, please don't say pilot, because everybody's going to think that we're just trialing it and see if it works or doesn't work, then we'll pull out. And then that's why we went to phase one. There's a huge debate about this two-year issue vis-a-vis uh, -vis longer periods. There are all kinds of models. The Germans don't have long-term contracts. Generally, you've heard that the Australians have long-term contracts. So can we learn and figure out how we go forward? We absolutely understand the issue that we don't have an ecosystem that supports uh, third-party access. The ecosystem being a leasing, leasing companies in South Africa. So we're moving fast and hard to get TE to set up its own leasing company because we've got the rolling stock, which gets available on a competitive basis uh, to the market. So whoever's able and willing to participate as a train operating company is able to have, um, have access. But I think what we're also trying to do is to have very open, direct engagements around how we go forward. Now, there's no running away from the fact that in our case, 
as a state-owned entity, and frankly, I think it's in everybody's interest. Beyond the PFMA, there's clause 217 in the Constitution that requires us to run a competitive process. So sometimes we don't talk as much as you'd like us to, but in the middle of a competitive process, we have to protect um, the process. But on the other side of the divide, definitely Volu working much closely to ensure that this is truly sustainable and ensuring that we learn in the process. And if the adjustments that have to be made, we will make uh, adjustments as we proceed. What is really um, a, a positive outcome out of really a truly horrible situation of the flooding in Durban is that by the time we come back on the 1st of April, fully operational on the 1st of April next year, we would be, have 42 slots on the container corridor and we are going to be making the 42 slots available in the market. And as we've said, we, if we plan to run an operation, we'll compete and will be subject to review by competition authority and the economic regulators. So really look forward to having that. This is just a brief update on where we're at with uh, Bokhubai Port. Uh, tomorrow the RFP should be coming out, which is a phase one RFP, and that's to build a new um, heavy ore, uh, a minerals, initially minerals focus um, <coughs> port out in the Northern Cape. Um, <coughs> you'll see, uh, if you do get, sorry, if you do get the, the documentation, the way that we've gone out and we've, after consultation with the Northern Cape government, we've basically put in a geographic area and we said between um, claims here and uh, Bohubai, um, you come and you look at that geography and given that a requirement that we're putting is to try and get a 500 kilometer railway line, you look and you determine where you would think is the most ideal spot to locate the port so that you optimize on best location for a deep sea port and best uh, location to ensure the shortest rail uh, connection. What we're quite clear is that ideally here we're not looking for engineering companies please uh, to bid. What we want is people who plan to build um, uh, the port on the, on the other side. So this is going to be an EPC uh, contract by the time we, we go out. And the intention is that by 2028 we should have a port that's operational in there. So we want to run it really fast and really hard. Um, no unnecessary extensions uh, are, are going to be entertained by us on our side at the very least, but if necessary to provide uh, space for additional information and for time, we will do to the extent that it is sensible. But it is a critical port for us to, to bring on board. This is just a, a, a drawing of some of the routings that we have been looking at. So towards the end, um, so that we are clear, is that on the rail side, our three primary priorities are security. Um, we really do need to have some serious attention to, uh, paid to this area. So we're piloting all kinds of options. And in fact, uh, last week Friday, we were in the Western Cape, and they indicated to us uh, um, um, an arrangement that... Uh, the metro, the Cape Town metro, had with Prasa to ensure that there was security. We're going to look at that as the model as well to see how far that takes us. Because one of the problems that we have, private security companies do not have arresting powers, which is a limitation. So if you were in a relationship with the uh, metro police, uh, part fund their activities as well, you would then be able to have a security force that would have arresting powers, changes uh, the situation quite fundamentally. Also, I think a positive outcome for all of our people, right, is that if we support, because we actually have to make sure that there are vehicles and the rest and the like, maybe the amount of visible policing in all of the more rural and far-flung areas in South Africa might go up and we would get greater security in South Africa. It's just a spillover effect that we're more than happy to support. On infrastructure side, have said it, uh, infrastructure maintenance is really a crucial area for us. Um, we've been looking at how much money we require on an annual basis. Ideally, we should be spending 9 billion rand on infra maintenance. But when we look at the install capa at the capacity that we have internally to transnet, but also in the economy, those we know who have been operating and have been doing quality work, because it's not everybody who does quality work, um, we should be able to be spending 7 billion rand. We're nowhere near that in terms of what we have available as transnet. So we're working fast and furious with the DBSA and the IDC. Uh, to see how we might be able to find, uh, to get a funding instrument that would in the first instant 
get us to the 7 billion rand and hopefully we'll be able to, between ourselves also, because we are looking to increase our investment uh, in that area, um, to have the capacity to ensure effective maintenance. But also in this area of maintenance, and I don't know if Jan will cover that in his presentation, this issue of tearing the system uh, between A, B and C tiers so that we actually ensure that maintenance suits the use of that infrastructure uh, going forward. And then on uh, local availability, uh, you know, uh, with the 1064, we only got 587 or so of the locomotives um, delivered. So we, when the process stopped, we had a shortfall in any event. So between the shortfall in any event, the extra challenge that we then had, which is um, one of the OEMs basically refusing to supply us with spare parts, and unfortunately, it's the OEM whose locals are the uh, newest in our fleet. It's also just exacerbated uh, the problem of local availability to ridiculous portions. You then add the two years of COVID and the supply chain uh, issues attached to that and the long lead items, and we are really in a mess in that space. However, um, as we've indicated, uh, sometime uh, in August, we're going to come out with an, um, an RFP to procure um, additional locums. And this time around, in a much more responsible fashion to ensure that there's sustainability in the industry, but also to ensure that as we uh, undertake the procurement, we're signing on long-term supply agreements uh, for, for critical components going forward. So it should increase the sustainability of the industry uh, going forward. This is um, this remains a picture that we show, which is the high-level initiatives, which are the partnerships uh, that we, we are running with, uh, most of them in one way or the other with pi private sector players in the areas of the value chain where they bring uh, greater value than, than ourselves. I've covered the ones which I thought were, were, were absolutely crucial. Uh, thank you very much.